You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 27, Sonnet 26. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? The good news from this week is that page three is just about complete. We're finalizing the captions and it is looking fantastic. The not so good news is that even though I've been taking it easy on my knee, my knee hasn't been taking it easy on me and I've been completely worn out. I'm scheduled for surgery at the beginning of next week and while I'm hoping that the preparations and my recovery won't interfere too much with the recording, I have a feeling I might have to skip an episode or two. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions and as importantly for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Sonnet 26 Lord of my love, to whom in vassalage Thy merit hath my duty strongly knit To thee I send this written ambassage To witness duty, not to show my wit Duty so great, which wit so poor as mine May make seem bare in wanting words to show it But that I hope some good conceit of thine in thy soul's thought, all naked, will bestow it. Till whatsoever star that guides my moving Points on me graciously with fair aspect And puts apparel on my totted loving To show me worthy of their sweet respect, Then may I dare to boast how I do love thee. Till then, not show my head where thou mayst prove me. Right. Let's analyze Sonnet 26. Lord of my love, to whom in vassalage Thy merit hath my duty strongly knit, To thee I fend this written embassage, To witness duty, not to show my wit. I believe that the meaning of Lord here is clear, but it's interesting to me that it appears just three times in the sonnet sequence. It's also interesting that there is only one instance of the phrase similar to Lord of my love, encountered in Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, and that is Lord of thy desire, from Book 14's story of Sybil and Aeneas, in which he guides him through a prophecy, and he tells her that he will honor her as a goddess, despite her protestations that she is not divine, and that she will continue to age until only by my voice I shall be known. For some sonnets, such as the famous sonnet 130's My Mistress' Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun, this provides an interesting fit, and I suspect that the story of Sybil is yet another thread woven into the fabric of the sonnets. Vassalage meant the service of a vassal, which means a subject, subordinate, or servant. We have already established that the sonnets are both Shakespeare's vassal, carrying his poetry to future readers, and vessel, capturing his spirit and keeping him alive in text form. Merit means that which one deserves, and worthiness or excellence, but originally derived from Old French mérite, which meant wages, pay, reward, thanks, merit, moral worth, that which assures divine pity, and in the 13th and 14th centuries was associated with spiritual credit and spiritual reward. Duty meant obligatory service, that which ought to be done, and also the force of that which is morally right from the Old French due, owed, proper, and just, and by the 1580s also carried the military sense of a requisite service. In Old English, knit meant to tie with a knot, bind together, fasten by tying, and by the 1520s had become do knitting, or weave by looping or knotting a continuous thread. By Shakespeare's day it had evolved to become compact or consolidated, the sonnets are bound together in a book and are woven from a continuous thread of words and thoughts. Shakespeare and the sonnets are tightly bound to each other. We can read this in two ways. 
that thy merit has strongly knit my duty, but also that my duty has strongly knit thy merit. In the latter case, Shakespeare would be the vassal, and the sonnets would be the lord, and it is Shakespeare's duty to the sonnets, and to his own son's memory, to make his poetry worthy of being read in the future. Send appears only three times in the sonnet sequence, and in sonnet 45 also appears along with the words embassy and messengers. Ambassage is the archaic form of embassage, meaning embassy, message, or errand. Embassy, which derived from Middle French's embassé, meant both message for a high official and, from Gaulish, a dependent or vassal, and literally one who is sent around. Witness was originally knowledge or wit, formed from wit and ness. But by the 1580s, it enjoyed the same use as it does today, which is to see or know by personal presence and to bear testimony. Having said that, it could still have been understood as to affix one's signature to a document to establish its identity. As discussed when analyzing Sonnet 17, show meant let be seen, put in sight, and make known, in particular to make available for examination but also meant the act of exhibiting, a display or spectacle, and an appearance put on with the intention to deceive. With this in mind, Shakespeare's sending of the sonnets to lend his wit, identity, and presence to the performance of their duty, rather than with the intention of showing off his wit or to deceive with it. In the first quatrain, Shakespeare is speaking to the reader via the sonnet, his envoy. For the duration of the reading, the reader is the current lord of the sonnet, who is also Shakespeare's love. Shakespeare is duty-bound to the sonnets and to his son's memory to reward the reader for reading. At the same time, the reader's excellence in reading the sonnets has rendered Shakespeare duty-bound to provide the reader with a pleasing and honest experience. Shakespeare sends this message to the reader, not to show off his cleverness, but to incorporate the reader as a witness to the performance of his duty. Duty so great, which wit so poor as mine, may make seem bare in wanting words to show it, but that I hope some good conceit of thine, in thy soul's thought, all naked, will bestow it. Poor, derived from the old French pauvre, meaning poor, wretched, dispossessed, inadequate, weak, and thin. The word knit in the first quatrain leads me to suspect that the word seem is intended both as appear and as the textile seem, suture, Junction, and bear could be an adjective or a verb, meaning naked, uncovered, unclothed, or to make bear or uncover. I was fascinated to learn that bear, to carry or bring forth, was traditionally spelled B A R E, even in Shakespeare's day, although in many sonnets he does use its modern day spelling. Wanting meant deficient or lacking and here might be read as lacking words, but could also be read as words about lacking. In the original quarto text, the word conceit was spelled with a P, and according to the online etymology dictionary, this was a normal spelling in Middle English, as the words conceit and concept were so strongly related. The word naked in line 8 connects to the word bare in line 6, and meant mere, pure, open to view, unconcealed, and by Shakespeare's day the expression, the naked truth, was already well worn in. In the second quatrain, Shakespeare is saying that his wretched wit may make his important duty and the resulting messages seem raw and unconcealed, because he's making use of words of loss and unfulfilled desire in order to share it with the world. But he hopes that some good thoughts and intentions of the readers will allow his verse entry into and safekeeping in their open, pure, and perhaps naive souls. Till whatsoever star that guides my moving points on me graciously with fair aspect and puts apparel on my totted loving to show me worthy of their sweet respect. As established before, stars in Ovid's Metamorphoses refers to the eyes of Narcissus' reflection and in the sonnet sequence it is the eyes of the reader that bring the sonnet to life. Point was another term that related to knitting and sewing and binding, as it meant to stitch or mend, and to furnish a garment with tags or laces for fastening. It also meant aim and indicate with the finger. Here, 
like in Sonnet 128, it's a reference to the reader tracing the words of the sonnet with their finger, as well as effectively pointing at Shakespeare, who is hidden between the lines. Aspect was an astrological term meaning relative position of the planets as they appear from Earth, and also meant one of the ways of viewing something, and by Shakespeare's time had the additional meanings of the look one wears and the appearance of things. In Old French, apparel meant preparation, planning, dress, and vestments, and so the noun would have signified fighting equipment, accoutrements, armor, weapons, and a personal outfit, a person's outer clothing, or attire. But apparel, P-A-R-R-E-L, derived from the word apparel, was the binding that fixes a yard to a mast, and this ties in both with the established nautical theme and with the sewing and binding metaphors from the first quatrain. Totted was another way of saying and writing tattered, and connects this with the totted weed of small worth held from Sonnet 2, the disheveled clothing and the crumpled old sonnet pages covering Shakespeare's naked grief. Sonnet 2 discusses a fighter's apparel, and Sonnet 25 talks about the worth of a fighter, so it's interesting that here the apparel is what will show Shakespeare's worth. Respect, another word derived from Old French, meant relationship, relation, regard, and consideration. It was only in the 1580s that it began to take on the additional meanings that we're familiar with today, feeling of esteem excited by actions or attributes of someone or something, courteous or considerate treatment due to personal worth or power, and point or particular feature. In the third quatrain, whatsoever star is whichever reader shows their face, stitching the words together as they follow them with their finger, the act of reading, clothing Shakespeare's tattered loving words, and proving him to be worthy of the reader's respect, regard, and consideration. Then may I dare to boast how I do love thee, till then not show my head where thou mayst prove me. Boast takes us back to Sonnet 25's of public honor and proud titles boast, in which boasting is allowed for those who are in favor with their stars. Head originally meant to be at the head or in the lead, but in Shakespeare's day became to direct the head towards. This ties in with the marigold from Sonnet 25, whose pride lies buried unless the sun shines upon it. Prove meant demonstrated to be true, derived from the old French show, convince, and put to the test. Once the reader has reconstructed Shakespeare in a reading that proves him worthy of respect, then he will be ready to boast of his love for both the sonnets and the reader. Without a reader to open the book, read the sonnets out loud, and see Shakespeare in their mind's eye, the bard will remain buried within the pages where he cannot be discovered. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?